Well, thanks very much for having me here to the Royal Society of Victoria today. It's great to have the opportunity to talk about this topic that I think is really uh, crucial to our uh, own persistence as a species. And uh, obviously, it's very important to me in my work, uh, and I hope you'll find it interesting. I'm going to start straight into some politics. Back in 2010, Minister Burke, uh, on behalf of us and with 192 other signatories, declared that uh, by 2020, the extinction of known threatened species will have been prevented. Their conservation status, particularly those most in decline, will have been improved or sustained. So this is a big promise to the rest of the world and to future generations to arrest what has become uh, known as the extinction crisis to start to turn around ecosystem decline. And uh, that promise has actually been transcribed almost verbatim into sustainable development goals. I'm sure many of you will know of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They set out a pathway for trying to achieve a sustainable future for the planet. And they're very important commitments that governments have made uh, around the globe that we can use to actually hold our governments accountable to the promises that we've made and particularly the sustainable development goal that I'm interested in today is the endeavour to take urgent and significant action to reduce the degradation of natural habitats, halt the loss of biodiversity and by 2020 protect and prevent the extinction of threatened species. So how are we doing? Well, as usual, with many of these types of promises, there wasn't a whole lot of thought given at the time about how we were going to measure our performance towards those 2020 goals. And indeed, now that we are past 2020, um, how we will reflect on our uh, progress towards these um, towards these HE targets and the sustainable development goals. So back in uh, 2016, the governments that signed on to the Convention for Biological Diversity developed uh, a program called the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. One of the main purposes of this body was to actually be able to track how we're performing against these international or global commitments to conserve biodiversity and ecosystem services. And a key output that came out in 2019 was the IPBS Global Assessment. And that's really tracking how we're progressing in terms of ecosystems and biodiversity as a planet. This is an amazing collaboration of uh, over 350 scientists and policymakers and practitioners uh, from around the globe uh, that draws on environmental evidence and data uh, from literally thousands and thousands of studies and programs to study nature uh, and ecosystem services. It's a huge effort to actually, and an unprecedented documenting of the globe's state and trend in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So what has the IPBS uh, Global Assessment found? I'll take a, f a step back first of all and just talk briefly about what ecosystem services are. I'm sure most of you have heard the term ecosystem services and probably some of you are very familiar and perhaps even work in the domain of ecosystem services. Bob Costanza, uh, back in 1997, very conveniently defined ecosystem services for us as the benefits uh, provided to humans through the transformation of resources or environmental assets, including land, water, vegetation and atmosphere. And this brings goods and services to us and, and we can break down those services into provisioning services. These are the basic things that we rely on uh, for life, like food and raw materials and medicines. Regulating services, this is the way nature actually allows life to exist by regulating air quality, climate and temperature, rainfall, cleaning air, cleaning water, you can imagine the sorts of things. Supporting services, so the basis of life, photosynthesis, soil formation processes and nutrient cycling. And then these cultural services, spiritual and religious values, the way we relate to nature as humans. We've sort of grouped into these cultural, aesthetic, spiritual, recreational and mental health services. And these are critical for our life. And so these ecosystem services are the benefits that nature brings to us as humans. One of the key questions in conservation science is uh, how much should we weight this ecosystem service angle is kind of, um, you know, we need species to survive ourselves angle versus, you know, the existence value of a species, what it means uh, to actually have a species go extinct uh, after, you know, 
50, 100 million years of evolution, it will never be observed again by any other human. I think, yeah, there's there's issues around the intergenerational equity. Uh, there's issues around, um, I guess, as you say, culture and heritage. Uh, and then there's the sort of existential issues around, well, if we keep losing biodiversity, if we keep losing genetic uh, diversity, then we are losing opportunities to solve problems, you know, and, um, we're, and we're losing quality of life. And uh, look, no, there's no answer. Uh, there's no clear answer. I, I don't think we focus too much on the cultural myself because that's my viewpoint. I, I believe largely uh, that it is about um, not so much the right to exist, but the right for everybody to experience nature and um, biological diversity in its most magnificent uh, form. And if we take away future generations' opportunities to do that, then I think that's a dreadful uh, breach of contract <laughs> with future generations, and it's uh, it's extremely tragic. So for me, that's the key issue, and it's also about our own quality of life because. My God, if you can't go out into the bush and just see how incredible it is um, and see a possum <clears throat> or see a plant, you know, because it's gone extinct, I just think that's, um, that's an immense tragedy as well. So, yeah, look, there's lots of elements to that. There's also having respect for uh, the culture that was here before Europeans came and, um, and, and their culturally significant species and making sure that, um, you know, to the extent possible, we can avoid continuing to plunder and ruin that amazing uh, environment that they uh, were the stewards of for, you know, probably 80, 100,000 years, goodness knows. The numbers change every every couple of years, don't they? But it's that's, that's a big part of it as well. So the global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services found something that I'm sure you're all quite aware of. Nature underpins all aspects of life. Two billion people rely on wood as their primary energy source. Four billion people rely primarily on natural medicines. And 70% of all drugs are natural or copies of natural drugs. 75% of all crops are animal pollinated. This is a really crucial story I'll come back to in a minute. And natural systems are the only carbon sink that are going to be viable for actually reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And at 5.6 gigatons per year, there's no way we're going to be able to provide an artificial carbon sink that's going to come anything close to nature's ability to actually sequester carbon from the atmosphere and store it in biomass. Natural pollinators, it's estimated, are worth around $560 billion a year to the global economy. So the loss of natural pollinators uh, is potentially an immensely, uh, an immensely troubling existential crisis that we face as humans. But of course, the capacity of nature to deliver these benefits to us is declining everywhere. So let's have a look at one of the headline figures from the IPBES global assessment. So first of all, the rows in this figure indicate these key contributions of nature to people. And so you can see up the top here, habitat creation and maintenance, pollination and dispersal of seeds and other propagules, the regulation of air quality and so on. These are nature's benefits to people. This next column here indicates what the global 50 year global trend is for these services. And so you can see here that habitat and creation and maintenance has a downward trajectory. It's very strongly decreasing. And this donut here in the next column indicates that this is a global result. So this is happening everywhere. And over on the right hand side, you can see some examples of some of the indicators that are used to measure the state and trend of nature's ability to bring these services to us. And so there's a couple of interesting ones here that I'm sure many of you will have um, will have thought about a lot recently. The regulation of hazards and extreme events, the ability of ecosystems to absorb and buffer hazards is declining and continues to decline globally. This is a strong trend and you might remember quite acutely for some the 2019-20 uh, fires, an example of a natural hazard that has been exacerbated because the ecosystems can't absorb the hazard in the way that they used to so that we're seeing the loss of land for agriculture, the loss of habitats for species, the loss of human life, the loss of infrastructure, and it's partly brought about because nature 
has no longer the ability to regulate these natural disasters. The regulation of detrimental organisms and biological processes is another highly concerning trend. It's been decreasing over the last 50 years. It's happening everywhere. And of course, we're talking about vector-borne diseases and other things that are going to impact on us because nature is no longer able to properly regulate detrimental organisms and diseases. So this is, uh, these are quite concerning trends. Pollinator loss is one of the big concerning trends that we've actually seen uh, and is highlighted in the IPBES global assessment. So 90% of wild flowering plants and 80% crop species depend on animals and insects for pollination. But over the last 27 years in Europe, we've seen a 75% decline in flying insect biomass in Europe. This is an immense decline. 16% of pollinators and 30% of bees are assessed as at high risk of extinction by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That's the group that assesses extinction risk for species. And as I mentioned before, $560 billion per year is the value that we place on crop productivity, and that's significantly at risk from wild pollinator loss. But of course, if we lost wild pollinators and we lost the abilities uh, for crop pollination, then the 560 billion a year would be the least of our concerns. We'd be seeing mass translocation and dislocation of people, um, famine and food crisis, uh, and basically uh, Armageddon. So, uh, so we've got a pretty serious uh, issue here with pollinator loss, and that's a real headline story from the IPBES um, global assessment. But of course, close to my heart, I guess, is that it's not all about us. We are in the middle of an extinction crisis that's identified very clearly by the IPBES assessment. You'll see here the trajectory of extinction loss globally uh, since the 1500s. And the way to read this graph is that on the y-axis here, we see the cumulative proportion of species that have become extinct since 1500, and it's broken down by these taxonomic groups. And you can see that trajectory change over the years since 1500. So you can see here that that mammal loss has been fairly consistent and linear across that time to the point where since 1500 we've lost about 2% uh, of, of our mammal species that existed at that time. The dramatic uh, exponential increase in amphibian loss is particularly disturbing. Obviously, that's uh, heavily driven by habitat modification and the rapid expansion of the chytrid fungus disease and other impacts on amphibians, loss of wetlands, loss of water quality. And so that is a very disturbing exponential uh, trend in uh, extinction since 1500. And you can see here for these other groups, that we're looking at globally, you know, these groups losing around 2% of their uh, membership since 1500. Now, are we in an extinction crisis? This little grey wedge here is the proportion of those species that we would expect to lose uh, through the natural processes of extinction that have occurred across uh, geological time scales. So you can see here that if that's the total proportion that we would expect to lose, and we're actually losing proportions like two and a half percent, then we're you know in that sort of ten to a hundred fold extinction rate that we hear used or cited as a figure to indicate that we are in fact in the midst of an extinction crisis. So what's driving these losses? What's driving the, the decline in ecosystem services, the loss of biodiversity? 75% of our land area globally is significantly altered relative to a 1700 baseline. 66% of ocean areas is experiencing increase in cumulative impacts, including ocean acidification and uh, plastic pollution throughout the oceans. Since 1700, 85% of the global wetland area has been lost. And you think about what wetlands provide us in terms of uh, nurturing life, in terms of breeding uh, fish and, and um, bird species, 85% of wetland loss since 1700 is just a gobsmacking statistic. We're really hoeing through it. Half of live coral cover on coral lease has been lost since the 1870s, and marine plastic pollution has increased tenfold since 1980. So we really are seeing these driving forces pushing 
our loss of biodiversity, accelerating our loss of biodiversity. And the WWF produce um, a report, the Living Planet Index, and a, and a global report every couple of years. And they have a graph called the Great Acceleration that just shows the loss of biodiversity and how it correlates with uh, the accelerated uh, emissions of um, carbon and uh, other gases into the atmosphere, the acceleration in population growth, the acceleration in the degradation of reefs and terrestrial ecosystems. So we really are seeing a great acceleration. And here's a great example, uh, a disturbing example of the great acceleration. Some of you may have seen this um, plot already. It's a great uh, graphic from Ante Lipinen in uh, Helsinki. Uh, and what it shows is the variation in temperatures around long-term averages that we've seen uh, since 1880. So it's an animation and this is 191 countries represented on this plot. And if you've got a big red blob, that means in that year you were well above the temperature average for that year. And if you've got a big uh, blue blob, it means you were below. So as we progress over time, since 1880, you can see there's that sort of random variation around the mean long long-term averages for temperatures. And as you start to get more towards the 1980s and 1990s, you start to see a change in the personality of this graph. And we're seeing more and more average temperatures that are higher than the long-term average until we get into the uh, late noughties where the trajectory is um, well, disturbing. And at 2017, you can see that, not surprisingly, uh, and same for 2018 and 2019, the data aren't in this graphic, we've been well above average almost everywhere. And that is a key driver now that we have to all worry about in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem loss. Let's just come back a bit now to our own situation here in Australia. Australia, as I'm sure you're all aware, is a mega diverse nation. It's one of the 17 mega diverse nations in the globe. It has more species than any other developed nation. We have incredible rates of endemism. Australia is very unique. We have very many plants and animals that don't exist anywhere else on the planet. 87% of our mammals are unique to Australia, they don't exist anywhere else. 93% of our reptiles, 94% of our frogs, they're only found here. And this makes Australia an incredibly unique and incredibly precious um, biodiversity asset on a global scale. But of course, as this has been reported a lot over the last couple of years, we are experiencing, we have experienced um, an incredible rate of extinction in this country. So since European invasion, we've had 110 extinctions in Australia that have actually been formally recorded. Of course, we expect that we've lost many more species than that that weren't recorded to Western science before they were lost. 81 of those formally recognised 110 extinctions in Australia, those species actually existed in Victoria before they were lost. So this is, um, this is an acute thing for Victorians. 1,800 species are now listed as at high risk of extinction, or more than 1,800 actually. Australia is responsible for 35% of all modern global mammal extinctions since 1,700. So of all of the extinctions, the mammal extinctions that have occurred across the planet, we are responsible for 35% of those uh, in such a short amount of time. Disturbingly, only a third of our listed species are not monitored at all. So we could be losing more species and we're just not going to know because um, we're not looking. And this is a very disturbing fact and I'll come back to the resourcing around both monitoring of threatened species and the development of recovery plans for threatened species in a minute. But let's just have a little reflect on this. That is the last ever recorded call of the Christmas Island pipistrelle. Nobody will ever hear that again in nature. That species is gone. That's one of our three uh, species that have, are now fully extinct uh, since, uh, since the EPBC Act was instituted. Um, it's one of our most recent extinctions, along with the Christmas Island forest skink and the Bramble K melamies. These are three of our most recent losses. We have other losses in Victoria. We're anticipating listing of losing uh, the earless dragon very soon. Um, extinction continues in Australia at an approximately linear rate. So despite 
the, uh, all the good efforts of conservation organisations and the things that people are doing well now, we are currently looking at an approximately linear increase in extinctions over time in Australia. So this is the cumulative number of extinctions on the y-axis and on the x-axis here. This is time. John Wynarski produced these uh, statistics by dredging back through the literature and they've plotted that cumulative loss of species in Australia since 1790. And you see there there's no sign of a bending of that curve. There's no sign of a clear abatement in our extinction crisis. And that is because we continue to clear habitats. We continue to see the devastating impacts of introduced species in this country. And I did mention already that we've lost 34 mammals in this country, which is an immense loss, including things like the very famous Tassie tiger. So coming back to our little global extinction graph here, I'm just putting this up for context. You can see again, that the number of mammals globally that have been lost since the 1500s around 2%. If you put that in the context of Australia's mammals loss, if you could even do a graph like this without having a broken stick um, y-axis, uh, this is about where we would sit in terms of our contribution to global mammal loss. So that's just a cute little graphical way of, uh, of thinking about where we sit. We are really the Don Bradman of mammal loss globally. The species that have gone extinct, um, of those 110, 80 of them had range in Victoria, but they weren't solely in Victoria. So, of course, there were bilbies in the top northwestern part of Victoria, um, a whole bunch of those species that we don't tend to think of as Victorian things, and perhaps because we didn't host much of their range, uh, but you know, they were here. Uh, and so the loss is... Um, is tangible and palpable from for even for you know Melbourneites. Uh, these were things that we could have observed here. And magnificent, amazing things, you know, which is why it's amazing to go to uh, one of these fenced reserves, go out to Mount Rothwell or go to um, Scotia Reserve up just north of Mildura or, or you know any any one of the number of amazing places around the country and experience what it's like to walk around, you know, in the evening uh, in, a, in a place that just has abundant uh, marsupial wildlife. It's totally different to the experience that we currently have. So we've already suffered an extinction of experience uh, in this country. And so I think to the extent possible, we should avoid continuing that extinction of experience. All right, it's not just about losing species, it's also about the ones that are still remaining, what's happening to their populations. And so uh, Eliza uh, Bayraktarov from uh, the University of Queensland and part of our NESP Threatened Species Recovery uh, Research Hub developed this Threatened Species Index over the last couple of years. And this graph here shows that on average uh, for threatened birds, we've seen a 50% decline in the population size of those uh, species since 1980. So a 50% loss on average for these threatened bird species in their population sizes since 1985. They're not extinct yet, these ones, but you can see that they're clearly on a trajectory to extinction. And 1985 is not that long ago. And for those of you of the right uh, generation, you might remember that uh, 1985 feels like pretty recent in our lives. Uh, and in that time, we've seen an average decline in threatened birds of half. Our Contribution to global biodiversity loss is uh, now very widely recognised. This is a paper from Anthony Waldron and colleagues uh, published in Nature in 2017. And it shows very clearly the hotspots of extinction and the hotspots of biodiversity loss around the planet. You can see here that Australia is identified as the second highest country in terms of loss of biodiversity on the planet and the highest in the developed world for modern losses of biodiversity. So unfortunately, our little secret is out and it's time for us, I think, uh, to restore our reputation as a uh, nature conserving nation. So what's driving these losses in Australia? Similar to the global drivers of loss, except we've got some special things that have happened here in Australia. Modern loss of habitat is still the number one driver of extinctions and biodiversity loss in Australia and continues to this day. We're still losing habitats 
piece by piece, we chip away at the last of the uh, remaining habitats for a lot of our threatened species, that's still a key driver. But of course, in Australia, we've had a special impact of introduced species, things that have been introduced quite recently. The most famous cases, of course, are feral cats, foxes. Feral cats contribute the loss of around 360 million birds a year. That's about a million birds a day are lost to cats across Australia. 60 Five million of those are from domestic cats. So there's something that we can do uh, with our domestic cats. But of course, it's not just cats and foxes that are impacting on our um, small mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians. It's introduced fish species like trout. It's introduced rabbits, introduced diseases. These uh, processes, these things that we've introduced to this continent are driving our species to extinction. And I would ask the audience uh, what they think the biggest driver uh, of extinction is in this country from these introduced species and threats. What's the single biggest threat? Just give you a moment to reflect on that. And of course, it's the terrifying rabbit. Rabbits contribute to the threatened status of the most species because most of our threatened species are plants and rabbits are a voracious consumer of seedlings of threatened species. And so you can see that the European rabbit comes up as the species that affects the most of our threatened species in this nation. So there's a uh, pause for thought. And of course, extreme weather and extreme events that we're now seeing under a changing climate are contributing to species losses. The Western ground parrot lost about 40% of its habitat to a fire in Western Australia about a year ago. One fire could take out the whole extent of Gilbert's Potteroo or the central rock rat. These are species that are highly restricted in their range and highly susceptible to large natural disasters. Uh, extreme heat and extreme weather has seen mass deaths of spectacle flying foxes and of course hot dry low rainfall periods can lead to nutrification and warming of water and mass fish kills that we saw at uh, Menindee not that long ago. So these extremes are adding a new type of pressure to uh, already highly stressed ecosystems and species. And I just wanted to reflect briefly on one of our most recent natural disasters, which was the 2019-20 fires. A couple of statistics there. 327 of our listed threatened species lost more than 10% of their range in that one single event. That's a lot of species to lose such so much range. And some of our species, around 50, of our threatened species lost 80% or more of their habitat in that one fire event. Of course, it was massive. The area burnt was bigger than the size of England, but the thing about it that really hit home, that seemed to differentiate it from a lot of previous fires was not just the extent, but the ferocity and intensity, the comprehensiveness with which this fire actually destroyed habitats. And here's some photos courtesy of uh, Mark Norman at Parks Victoria who flew in a helicopter over these areas straight after the fires. And you can see you're not seeing the green gullies that have been left residual in this fire landscape. It's a comprehensive destruction. Of course, there are a couple of places where things survived, green gullies survived as refuges for animals and plants to go to and then radiate out from later. But relative to previous fires, this was a comprehensive destruction. I went to Kangaroo Island not long after the fires where a huge impact happened for the Kangaroo Island Dunart and the Kangaroo Island Glossy Pack Cockatoos because of just how much of that island burnt so ferociously. It took out most of the remaining habitat and places where Kangaroo Island Dunarts were thought to exist. And the great news in that visit was that they found one while we were there in a tiny little patch of habitat. Um, and they immediately uh, built a predator-proof fence around that with the help of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a dreadful outcome and it has probably condemned this species to um, you know, being extinct in the wild, given that it's probably only behind a fence now, uh, but at least we haven't lost it completely. So in summary, the global assessment of the IPBES found that goals for conserving and sustainably using nature cannot be met under current trajectories. And only transformative change would allow our goals to be met by 2030. We can't, we haven't, we didn't meet our goals by 2020. Unfortunately, Minister Burke's promise didn't hold up, but if we're gonna actually have any chance of meeting our sustainable development goals by 2030, a lot has to change. And this is not just 
the rantings and ramblings of greeny scientists. The World Economic Forum, which is not noted as a particularly radical organisation, produces a global risk report for the world economy every year. The 2021 risk report places environmental losses and environmental damage as four of the top five global risks to the global economy. So you can see here, risk in economists speak is considered as a multiplication of the likelihood of something terrible happening and the impact of that thing happening. So the further up here in the right hand top corner you are, the more acute the risk is that you pose to the global economy. And you can see here that biodiversity loss is right up here in the top two or three risks, along with climate action failure and, not surprisingly, infectious diseases, which could be considered a human medical problem. But of course, we know that a lot of that is to do with nature and how we interact with nature. So I would be tempted to make that a green diamond myself if I was an economist. So you can see here that environmental problems are dominating the minds of economists when they worry about global economic risk. Okay, so after that overview of the state and trends of nature, I'd understand that you might be feeling a little flat, but stick with me because good things are happening. Uh, and there's lots that we can do together. And for the next little while, I'm going to talk about a few things that are happening and that, that we need to do and can do um, as a society to try and improve the state uh, of biodiversity and uh, try and bend the curve and recover species and ecosystems. Now, of course, there are many personal choices that we can make. We can look for biodiversity friendly products in our supermarkets. Don't buy fish unless it's actually certified as sustainably caught by the Marine Stewardship Council. Don't buy timber that's not certified as sustainable by the Forest Stewardship Council. Biodiversity friendly consumption is something we can do and we already have a lot of great approaches and great initiatives to try and help us be thoughtful about the way that we consume. And there's all sorts of new things happening. People are developing biodiversity friendly coffee. Um, you can actually go out now and buy biodiversity friendly firewood. So there's lots of things that you can actually do in your daily life to be more biodiversity friendly. You could keep your cat inside. 65 million birds a year are taken by cats. We're getting the numbers in now for mammals and reptiles, but it's immense. Domestic cats contribute significantly to that impact. Keep your cat inside, it's simple. Or maybe get a pet sugar glider instead, if that's legal. Turn your lights off, get political write submissions, when there's a submission open about changes to environmental laws, when there's submission open about new uh, policies, get involved because you can actually make a difference and maintain your hope. All right, enough of the proselytising about what we should all personally do. Now I'd like to talk about some of the bigger opportunities that we need to do in coordination as a society and as scientists and as organisations that are responsible for conserving biodiversity and ecosystem services. We need to prosecute the case for adequate resourcing. We don't have enough resourcing available at the moment to actually solve these biodiversity problems, but we could. It's not much money, I'll come back to that. And we need to better integrate biodiversity into businesses. There's some great stories about how businesses are promoting biodiversity in their activities, how business organisations are promoting that among their members. I'll come back to a couple of stories about that in a minute. We need to embrace regenerative agriculture and biodiverse carbon farming. I'll talk about an example of that. We need to recognise that over 60 plus thousand years, there are some people in our society who really know how to manage land. We've got to start actively engaging with Indigenous people uh, and doing two-way learning. Uh, to understand how better to manage our land and resources. We need biodiversity sensitive urban design. A lot of biodiversity that is highly threatened exists in urban areas. Uh, we learn, need to actually do a better job of monitoring, adapting and innovating. And this is a role particularly for science, but science in engagement with policy and management. And we've got to give hope. So let's have a look. I'm going to start with some great news. When we spend money on biodiversity conservation, it works. This graph here, produced again by Anthony Waldron and colleagues in this paper in Nature, shows that the more you spend, the less biodiversity you lose. So this graph shows that for the nations that were spending more, the biodiversity loss in modern times has been 
less. So that's a really nice story that we can tell to Treasury. This is not money that you're pouring down a deep hole. It's money that actually brings results. And so that's really great news. Some more good news. In the United States, where if a species is listed as threatened under their Endangered Species Act, the Act mandates that the government must fund the recovery of that species. So every one of their 1,600 listed species in the United States has a mandated recovery budget that has to be agreed to by the experts uh, that know that species best. And what does that mean? What it means is that their species do recover. So here is a graph of the cumulative recovery of endangered birds that were listed under the Endangered Species Act in the United States. And so the x-axis here is time and the y-axis here is the proportional recovery. So on average, if you've been listed uh, under the Threatened Endangered Species Act in the United States for 32 years, then you'll have seen a, about a 200% recovery. If you were lucky enough to be listed early on near the conception of the Act, then on average, those species have seen dramatic recovery, six-fold recoveries. That's what we need to see. And this works. They actually end up delisting species in the United States because their recovery efforts are so successful. 46 species have been delisted since the inception of the Endangered Species Act, including grizzly bears, bald eagles. These are really crucial stories to tell because we know that their system works and ours doesn't. What's the difference? Here's a graph of our spending on biodiversity and threatened species and compared to the spending in the United States. So the United States are blue dots and we are green dots. The blue dots show that in the United States, they spend between two and two and a half billion dollars a year on conserving just their threatened species alone. They have other big environmental programs that do other things, but just for threatened species conservation, we're looking at around two billion Australian dollars a year. In Australia, our total environment budget for everything from land care, water, you name it, including threatened species, uh, has hovered here for a number of years around 500 million. There was a little spike in 2017 for the Reef Trust, but then it's gone back down to uh, below that in more recent years. And that's the total environment budget. This is the threatened species budget summed across the Commonwealth and state governments, $140 million in 2017, around $120 million in 2018. You can see that we're less than a tenth of what's being spent in the United States on threatened species. Now, of course, things have changed a little there over the last couple of years. We can't quite figure out exactly what they're spending now, but their systems, their legal systems, are strong enough that I suspect they are actually still spending similar amounts. And of course, now uh, we have even more reason for optimism about the, the story in the United States. Unfortunately, not the case here. Our spending in Australia is pitiful, even though we actually have more species on our threatened species list than they have in the United States. So we figured out by looking at the average expenditure uh, required to secure a threatened species in these broad taxonomic groups, that on net, we would need to spend around $1.6 billion a year to recover our listed threatened species nationally. And I would put that at around $300 million a year in Victoria, given the species that we have listed in this state. Now that might sound like a lot of money to some people, $1.6 billion a year. Let's just have a look at some comparisons. As a nation, we spend $580 million a year on pet grooming, we spend $1.1 billion a year on pets. This is all pets, novelty products and toys, Diamante collars and the like. We spend $2.5 billion a year just on cats. And in, on net, we spend $13 billion a year on pets. So it strikes me that we can definitely afford this. We can afford to spend $1.5 billion a year to secure all of the threatened species on our threatened species list and actually conserve the natural and cultural heritage that are associated with those species. A couple of other little things, we give about a billion dollars worth of fuel tax concessions to coal mining companies in this country annually. And of course we spend about $40 billion a year on defence. So I reckon we can afford this as a nation. We do have a tendency to think of things in percentage of GDP, um, which uh, I understand the habit, uh, and obviously the Treasury needs to allocate its GDP, allocate its, um, its tax revenue across a lot of different things. We can afford 
to do this. There's a, 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 and, a, and I don't care if it's uh, what, whatever percentage of our GDP versus America's GDP, uh, they are just lucky that for them, it's a pitifully small problem to solve. For us, it's a quite pro small problem to solve in a financial sense. We can definitely afford to do it. So, yeah, I acknowledge the comparison, but I don't actually think it's a valid reason not to do it. Um, and, yeah, they do. They have 1,600 species on their list, so it's a, it's comparable. You know, we have about 1,800, so it's it's um, it's a comparable-sized problem. Uh, they're managing it quite well, and we're not. Let's talk about some other things. Some great initiatives happening uh, around sustainable farming in this country. 60% of Australia's land mass is used for agriculture in some form. So if we can't achieve good biodiversity outcomes on farmland, then we're toast. And there's some great initiatives happening. Michelle Young and David Lindemeyer at ANU run the Sustainable Farms Program. They're out with willing farmers on a weekly basis talking about what can be done. There are incentives around now. The, the Victorian government and the Australian government over the last few years has developed some incentive programs for improving uh, biodiversity outcomes on farms. It's not enough at the moment, but that's a really key area of future investment that we need to encourage. Tiverton Farm is a great example where they're growing world-class wool. They've put up a fence and they're reintroducing bandicoots. The prospect of having a critically endangered species living on your farm that's not interfering with your farming activities and in many cases is actually enhancing them because an individual bandicoot can turn over up to 10 tonnes of soil a year. Why wouldn't you want bandicoots on your farm? Plus they're awesome. There's some great work going on in the Rice Growers Association. About 60% of the suitable range for the Australasian bittern, this rather fascinating and highly endangered bird here, is on privately owned rice country. And so there's a certification scheme now that rice farmers can engage with and they can produce bittern friendly rice. It's labelled as such. It's at low cost to the farmer. It's something that they can actually talk about in their labelling. And again, 50% of Victoria's landmass is used for agriculture. So why wouldn't we engage in that? And that is in fact why the UN Convention for Biological Diversity has named farming for nature as one of its top priorities uh, for improving outcomes for nature globally. Here's another example. This is a local company called Wood for Good. They specialise in taking low productivity agricultural land, growing timber on it that can be used for firewood, it can be used for craft woods, but they're growing it in biodiverse plantations. So they're taking something that's got almost zero value as a biodiversity asset. They're putting something onto it that has commercial value and biodiversity value. And of course, when you grow trees, you sequester carbon. The forest is permanent. They do harvesting in a way that actually maintains biodiversity values on the forest. It's a great initiative. You know, that's a really good why a good example of the integration of biodiversity and business. We need to learn from traditional owners. After 60 plus thousand years of active land management all over the whole continent, there's a lot of amazing knowledge there. There's also a lot of value for traditional owners in incentives that we can provide for them for conserving culturally significant species and species that are significant to whitefellas because of the EPBC Act listing as threatened. So this is a huge opportunity. Some great work being done here by Anya Scroblin from the University of Melbourne, who has been working with Matu Ranges up in Matu country. This is a, uh, a determination, a native title determination about the size of Tasmania in northern Western Australia. And on that country is some of the last remaining strongholds of the, the Greater Bilby. The local ranger group, here you can see a picture of Gladys and Pamela, who are leaders in the local ranger group, are actually leading the conservation of the bilby in their area. And they've got Anya in to help them design monitoring programs so that they can understand how their bilby is doing. And they institute the monitoring programs as part of their ranger group. And in the process, they take young local community members out onto country. They're learning about their country again, not just how to conserve the bilby, of course, but all the other attributes of the country that are so important to them and this is great work. Native title rights exist over about 42% of Australia's land mass uh, and about 60% of our national listed threatened species have uh, all or part of their range on um, land that is owned and managed by Indigenous people. So uh, the relationship uh, with Indigenous people and conservation that is so ancient is hugely important to us uh, as a whole nation.
and it needs to be better resourced and better encouraged because the current funding for IPAs and ranger groups is tenuous and small. It could dramatically improve. That's been set up partly as, a, as an environmental um, instrument in order to solve uh, some of their pressing environmental problems like inappropriate fire regimes that um, started to take hold when Matu people were taken off their country. Um, the um, uh, proliferation of, of feral predators, um, particularly cats up there. Um, so they're, you know, they're really trying to uh, bring their country back to something that uh, is, you know, a state, I guess, that some of their, their older uh, members can, can remember and uh, but it's a lot about um, maintaining that the cultural connection uh, to country getting their younger members out on country learning from the the senior rangers um, and maintaining that sort of link to link to the land um, so so there's a an intrinsic cultural need for that in, uh, in groups like the Matu people who are so, I guess, ha had been so intrinsically connected to land. Joint land management, we've seen some fabulous initiatives, including this joint land management program for the Jaja Warung parks, just up near Bendigo. There's so much benefit for local communities and for conservation of the joint land management opportunities, including bringing that incredible knowledge of traditional fire practices back into the landscape. Related but different um, is the Icon Species in Schools program. I think this is an incredibly promising initiative about re-engaging young people in their schools with locally important species. Here we've got an example where the students are learning about the species that used to exist on their school in their area. They're actually engaging with an Indigenous gardening program and they're actually learning about their local threatened species. They're bringing them back into their schools they're connecting with the local um, traditional owners and Indigenous culture in the process. The students are demonstrating significant increase in their engagement with nature. Coming back to the grubby business of law and policy, I uh, just came from a Senate inquiry yesterday into a new bill that the government's seeking to put through to streamline environmental approvals, cut green tape and develop national environmental standards. If this bill goes through, then we're going to see, I think, a dramatic reduction in accountability, uh, the measurement of and, and outcomes for biodiversity in this country. The independent review of the EPBC Act run by Professor Graham Samuel came out in October 2020. Professor Samuel's identified significant weaknesses in our current um, flagship threatened species legislation. He set out a pathway for reform. There's a huge opportunity for us to engage with that pathway. We just have to make sure that the government understands that uh, they need to look towards the recommendations of Graham Samuel in order to get this right. Uh, and at the moment, we're not seeing much evidence of that. So we really need to see people who have knowledge of environmental outcomes engaging with uh, government at every level to make sure that we see environmentally responsible and sustainable policy decision making and legislation. I heard a really interesting statistic yesterday from Martine Marin, and I believe it was published in a paper by uh, Michelle Ward from the University of Queensland uh, in the last year that indicated that over 90% uh, of the vegetation loss uh, that, that has occurred in Queensland in the last decade, I think, um, was never assessed. It never came to assessment under the EPBC Act. So we're losing uh, huge amounts of, of habitat and native vegetation without it even uh, without it even being checked by the Commonwealth. Um, and of course, of the ones that do get checked, more than 90% of them are, are, are then approved. So um, it's, uh, it's definitely, the legislation is definitely not working as a big blocker for people to be able to do stuff on their land. Um, it may from time to time uh, slow down their uh, ability to do so, but you know, that's a risk management problem, right? Uh, I'm not really quite sure what we can do about that other than to properly resource the, um, the assessment and approvals divisions in the various departments, which also would hopefully improve compliance with the EPBC Act. The resourcing for those groups in, in the government department, the Commonwealth Department, uh, is pitiful.
Uh, and that's really the root of the cause of the delays. Uh, so I think they should reflect a bit more on how they're managing their own um, business before they start thinking uh, or prosecuting the argument that we need to cut the rules or cut the regulations in order to make things um, approvals more rapid. Of course it will, but we'll suffer a immense environmental damage if we, if we go down that minimal uh, regulatory pathway. I generally like to sort of go back to can we or can't we afford to lose these species? If the answer is we can't, then we've just got to have the rules in place to, to make sure that we don't. Coming back to uh, some of the more scientific elements, one of our key challenges in biodiversity conservation is just knowing what's going on. We think we might have a good idea about how to manage these species and ecosystems, but unless we monitor, then we're often left in the dark about how effective those efforts are. We know how to monitor. We know that ecologists over the last hundred years have been figuring out how best to monitor and learn. Mostly the problem is we don't have the resources to do it. So again, trying to put resources in place to ensure that we can monitor all of our threatened species, learn about whether they're declining and therefore do something about it, learn about what actions are most effective. So we have to do that more consistently and for more species. As I mentioned before, one third of our listed threatened species aren't monitored at all. And in a recent uh, survey that's actually published in this book by Sarah Legg and colleagues, they found that about half of the monitoring programs are actually quite poor. Here's a great example of some recent work that has been done by Darren Southwell in collaboration with the Australian Department of Environment and uh, the Victorian Department of Environment, looking at how we would design monitoring programs to understand the impacts and track the potential recovery of threatened species across Australia after the 2019-20 uh, fires. And that's been a very useful bit of work where he's synthesised all of the existing data for threatened species that were identified as impacted by those fires. He then produced species distribution models for those species that basically map where the suitable habitat is for each of those species across the uh, fire scar area, overlaid that with the fire scar and fire severity to identify where the gaps in our knowledge is, where the gaps in our survey effort is, so that we can prioritise where we put new resources into monitoring so that we can track changes for these species that were really impacted by the fires. And you can see here his final product is basically a map that visualises where, for each of these major taxonomic groups, we need to actually go and prioritise effort for monitoring. So it's a really important bit of work. The main thing is we need the resources to actually pay for the monitoring. And that's the thing that's mostly missing at the moment. Of course, you don't have to go everywhere to monitor biodiversity impacts in um, of something like the fires. You know, we we always are taking a sample, uh, and then we're inferring from that sample. Uh, but you can't infer from a sample of zero. So uh, you do need to do some observation of species through through throughout their range. But it can be and is often you know a very small proportion of their range that you actually survey. You know less than one percent. We could cost out monitoring programs uh, for all of these species, and I haven't. So I'm reticent to put uh, numbers on it. But I think they would be relatively small numbers. We'd be talking about you know a couple of million bucks a year, you know, uh, in order to actually have a, a much more strategically deployed comprehensive monitoring program for these species. Monitoring is getting cheaper and cheaper because technology to uh, enhance monitoring and improve the quality of monitoring is, is improving. And so we don't need to go to as many sites uh, as often. And in some cases, we don't have to go to the sites at all. We can deploy a, a, um, a, sound, um, a sound meter or something once, and then, uh, and then Nick can send us data on a minute by minute basis uh, for the next, for as long as the battery lasts. And, you know, that's so that there's that kind of technology that's reducing costs uh, and increasing effect. Um, I don't think cost is a particularly strong uh, argument for mo not monitoring. I think if we really cost it out and we decide we need to know, we can afford that too. Responding to change is a huge priority for science. 
So here's a little example from Western Australia. This work's led by Nikki Mitchell out of UWA in collaboration with the West Australian government and the Perth Zoo. Basically, that rainfall is declining in the Perth catchments. That's having a massive impact on species like the Western Swamp Tortoise that has actually declined dramatically in areas just north of Perth. So Nikki's been looking at translocation of individuals from the northern part of the range down to the southern wetlands that are in cooler and wetter places. And the ones that get moved into the cooler, wetter places are still highly effective in reproduction. They're, they're actually performing really well. And these are the places that are going to have the environmental profile in the future that this area currently has. So this is about planning for adaptation for species that are on the brink of extinction. We need a lot more of this very active and thoughtful approach to finding solutions for threatened species under climate change. This is a bush heritage property out in central western Victoria called Nardu Hills. It is undergoing rather significant dieback and this is attributed to long-term drying uh, and increases in heat. That means that the main tree species, the grey box tree species in that area, and I think brown stringy bark as well, are really struggling. So they've been working with CSIRO to look at different future scenarios. They've then been sourcing provenances from other parts of the country that have actually evolved in drier and hotter parts of the country. And they're doing a planting trial on Nadu to see how well those, if you like, hotter, drier provenances perform. And already they're seeing results that indicate that the provenances from other parts of the country up around Juni, Mathaur, are actually doing much better on Nadu Hills than the local provenances. So a really great story, I think, of science and management working really well together. Private land conservation is another key opportunity here for conserving species in this country. At the moment, if you look at the profile of conservation, so James Fitzsimons from TNC did this, the data here only go to 2012 and we have seen a dramatic increase in the amount of Indigenous estate and some increase in the private land conservation estate to make up a greater proportion of this total area of um, conservation in Australia. Private land conservation still only makes up less than 10% of our total conservation estate. So the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, which has around 650 million uh, square kilometres, I believe, of private land area and conservation in Australia, is one of our leading private land conservation organisations. They actually have fenced areas that keep out predators so that highly vulnerable species like this Rufus hare wallaby here can actually persist and thrive behind the fence. Bush Heritage Australia is similar, uh, but more with a focus on uh, ecosystem restoration. They have properties all over Australia. These are two of the leading private land conservation organisations. Much of our threatened species and threatened ecosystems exist on private land. This is Basalt Plains grassland just uh, west of Melbourne. Most of it's still on private land. We're down to less than 1% of the pre-European extent of this amazing ecosystem just in our backyard. If we're not working with private landholders to, to secure the conservation of this ecosystem, it will be gone. Cities and urban areas also host a huge array of threatened species. So Kylie Soans and Pia Lentini, apology for not having their names there, uh, from Melbourne University did a study recently that showed that around 39 species uh, across Australia are restricted to only urban areas. And these are some of our most threatened Western Swamp Tortoise. Locally, the Kilsyth spider orchid, critically endangered species, they're only in urban areas. And this brings me to another fascinating and, and uh, inspiring initiative being run out of RMIT. It's called Biodiversity Sensitive Urban Design. They're working with architects and developers to visualise and actually now plan developments that are accommodating for species, biodiversity and ecosystems. And of course, this has huge benefits, not just for those species, but also for the people who get to live in places that might one day look like this. Finally, we need to keep people engaged and involved in conservation. Places like Pullen Pullen, where 
This wonderful species, the night parrot, was recently rediscovered. And these conservation organisations uh, like Bush Heritage and Australian Wildlife Conservancy are conserving these places to ensure that these sorts of species can stay in the game. And there are good stories like this. In fact, we wrote a whole book about it called The Book of Hope. This was led by Stephen Garnett from Charles Darwin University. And it's a wonderful testament to the outcomes that can occur for threatened species and ecosystems when you have have the right people who are dedicated, they link up with the right organisations and they get the funding and they can actually bring species back from the brink. Uh, so we have to keep telling these stories and we have to keep showing people what's possible if we persist and if we, if we invest. So thanks very much for your time today. I've really revelled in the opportunity to um, share with you some of these stories and please do get in touch with me if you'd like to find out anything else about some of our threatened species conservation work. I think the, the key message is um, the situation is dire. These, uh, these reports of uh, biodiversity loss are real, um, but we can solve this and we can afford to solve it uh, and we basically know how to do it. There's simple things we have to stop doing, like clearing species habitat or degrading it. We know uh, that it's going to cost a fair bit to control foxes and cats uh, throughout the key areas uh, that they need to be controlled in order to keep species in the game. Um, but we can afford that too. Uh, I, I think the, the key message for me is um, we've got to do it. We can do it. So let's do it.